right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about exactly what, Re what Rebecca talked about, which was breaking the silos. And I'm kind of calling this starting over because starting over means kind of going back to the very first step when we're planning our social marketing interventions, which is what is that first decision that leads us to move into one direction or another? So very quickly, my name is Jeff Jordan from Rescue Social Change Group. We are based in the States, um, and we are a uh, behavior change marketing company that's been around for about 14 years. And we work exclusively in positive social change, mostly in health, like tobacco, um, obesity, violence prevention, after school programs, et cetera. Um, and you have some more information about us in, in your bag. And so one of the things that um, no one ever believes me when I say this, but in the US alone, we spend, uh, in terms of the government, nonprofits, and foundations, between five and $10 billion every year on positive social change, on behavior change campaigns. This is not all spent on social marketing, as many of you probably are aware. It's dispersed between things like policy change and health education and mass media campaigns. But this is how much money it's worth to change people just in one country. And the challenge here is that, unfortunately, a lot of these funds are wasted. They're wasted on misapplied strategies, on antiquated insights, on raising awareness, my favorite thing, um, and preaching to the choir, right? Making health campaigns that appeal mostly to healthy people, um, anti-tobacco campaigns that appeal to people who don't smoke. And so the problem, the problem with this is that, unfortunately, a lot of um, we, we can fix this. We can fix this, as, as Roberto said, we as social marketers can change the world, and I know that that's very um, it, you know, fun and nice to say, but in reality, we could. The kind of research that we're doing, the kind of strategies that we're developing, they are the kinds of change that can happen in so many different countries and so many different communities if we only had the resources. Well, the resources are being spent on behavior change. They're just not being spent on the kind of behavior change that's evidence-based, that's consumer-oriented, that's citizen-oriented, et cetera. So what do we have to do? Well, first problem is that when governments put this money out, they're calling for things specifically. They have already decided what the solution is. Oftentimes, before doing the research, before talking to their consultants, before any of this, they call out for policy change campaigns, for health education campaigns, sometimes for advertising specifically for problems that maybe this is not the most efficient way to cause change. And so we say, oh, that's so frustrating. You know, I wish that they would just put out a call for some social marketing so that we can go in and do research and help them figure out, well, what's the best way to cause change? Well, the problem is, is us. We're part of the problem. We're part of the problem because we focus so much time kind of deciding on, well, no, that's not social marketing because that's missing P number seven. And without P number seven, you are not achieving the social marketing principles fully. That hurts us. It hurts us because when these governments are trying to figure out, you know, people who don't understand change, people who are just trying to allocate funds and allocate a budget, they understand a policy change because you can describe it in a few different words. You can, they understand health education. It's easy to understand, easy to describe. But when we talk about social marketing, it's not quite easy to describe and easy to understand. So to the people who are actually making decisions about where to spend money and what, what all these resources and efforts are going to go to, social marketing isn't really top of mind. It's too complicated for the governor's spouse, the mayor, the reporter. These are the people that drive funds. These are the people who sit at home at night and say, hey, honey, we really need to do something about binge drinking in our community. I just heard from Sally that her boy got in an accident and we've got to do something. I think we should get more health education out there. If the governor's spouse, if the mayor, if the reporter can't easily explain social marketing, then there will never be a social marketing movement. It's impossible to create a movement if in layman's terms, our concepts cannot be understood. So rather than focus on what is or what is not social marketing, and of course all of this is important to make our strategies more effective, but rather than focus on what is or not, what if we represent behavior change itself? What if we just say that we are the science of behavior change? We are the science of what kind of strategies to choose and when, what works and what doesn't work, and that everything is social marketing. Not whether it has one P or eight Ps, but all of it. 
All of it is social marketing, some of it's bad, and some of it's good, but it's all there. And by bringing that together and saying that social marketing is simply the science of behavior change, well then, then the reporter understands what we're talking about. It understands that, hey, the same principles that sell products aren't gonna work exactly the same way when we're trying to change behavior. Or that policy change is not the only approach to change of behavior. It'll be easier to explain these things to people. Segmentation, consumer oriented, uh, citizen oriented strategies, behavioral focus, we have so many universal principles that apply to so many different strategies that even if someone learns one thing from us, their strategy improves. And so what does this look like and what does this mean? Well, if we represent all behavior change, then what that means is that we can influence every single behavior change strategy to be better. And as a chorus of hundreds and thousands of people around the world, we can convince everybody that, hey, there is something better than going out and doing mass communications. There is something better than just doing health education for every single problem that's out there. There's actually a more scientific way of doing this. And let us help you understand that. The first step is we have to simplify our pitch. Because if we can't explain what we do in a single sentence, then, well, that spouse's wife, that governor, that that, uh, that mayor, that reporter, that whoever it is out there that's trying to decide what to do about a social problem, they can't put money behind our strategies. Um, a recent example of this was in 2008 when the Obama administration first came into office. At that time, the book Nudge was all the rage. And Nudge was such an easy concept, right? Such an easy concept. You could just nudge people to change. And that's it. So easy. It swept the White House. Everybody who was connected to the White House was saying, hey, you've got to read Nudge, because if you don't read Nudge, you're not going to understand how the Obama administration wants to cause change, et cetera. And that simple concept was the underlying concept for so many of the strategies that they wanted to implement. There was just one problem. There wasn't a Nudge industry. There weren't all these Nudge companies that you could hire. There weren't all these Nudge consultants. There weren't Nudge things, right? So it was like this idea that lived in the White House, but then when it tried to kind of flow out, it failed. Now, if the White House had the same enthusiasm about social marketing, it would have been able to tap into this whole world of experts and consultants and people that have been doing research for years. But the problem is, is that it wasn't quite as sexy and quite as exciting, so Nudge became the thing. If we can make what we do as exciting as Nudge was able to make what they do, well, then we can cause a lot more change because we can be on the tip of the tongue of the people who are making these decisions. The second step, is that we have to help ensure that the right strategies are applied to the right behaviors. And this is actually one of the biggest problems that whether you call it social marketing or you say it's just policy change or you say it's health education or you say behavior change, whatever it is, one of the biggest problems that our industry faces is that people are applying the wrong strategy to the, wrong, to the right behavior. There are many different ways to cause change. There's behavioral economics, there's education, there's social enterprise, there's policy change, there's culture change. And what we have is silos. We have silos where people, all they do is one of these strategies. I know folks in certain federal agencies in the US that only do policy change. You got a problem, I got a policy to solve it. And that's their approach to everything. Then we got other people who all they do is education. They're like, oh, there's a problem. Well, we just need more commercials and posters and things to educate people. And these folks, they go to different conferences and they reach different science and they look at different textbooks, and they have different experts, and they all live separately. And the reality is, is that not one of these strategies applies to every behavioral problem. And there's probably more than five, but these are the, the five more, most common. And so the challenge here is that every time one of these gets misapplied, then people think, well, there is no expertise around behavior change, no one really knows what they're doing that well, and so, well, let's just revert to the other one or go back to the other one, and then there's never really a movement that begins around this science because it's living in all these different areas. And so what we have to do is make sure that the path doesn't come before the behavior that when we're working out in the field, that we're helping our funders understand that, yes, I know you heard a lot about policy change, but actually, let's look at this behavior and see what our other options are and make sure that policy change is actually the right strategy or health education or whatever it is. Because too often, practitioners and funders are choosing the pathway before they even understand what's wrong because they assume that's the only thing that they can do. So let me show you some examples of this. The first example is healthy eating for kids. Most people 
will assume that if you want to encourage kids to eat, you got to educate them about it. You got to put up some posters, right? There's no posters in the cafeteria about the five vegetables they should be eating, and so why would they ever know they're supposed to eat these? And so for decades, we have redesigned the healthy eating poster for kids probably 1.3 million times. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of versions of it if you're interested in uh, finding one for yourself. But as we've learned over time, that just in the school cafeteria, behavioral economics actually could work a lot better than any kind of health education would. Changing the size of the cereal bowls, changing the location of the salad bar, changing the um, making kids pay for the cookie rather than getting the cookie for free, um, adding trays, because when you eliminate the tray, they'll use their extra hand for dessert and not for a salad. All of these little behavioral economic changes that completely change the way kids eat without ever putting a poster up anywhere. Now, if there was a proposal for health education and to make posters, well, then people will make posters. And the challenge is, is that there is no term, there is no umbrella for someone to go out there from the government and say, hey, we're looking for a consultant to help us figure out which strategy, which behavior change strategy will lead us to change. So inevitably, they end up choosing this path before often they know anything about the behavior that they're trying to change. But it's not just healthy eating. It's also gang violence. In gang violence, the solution is usually laws, law enforcement. What is wrong with our laws? What's wrong with our penalties? Are we strict enough? Are we tough enough? What are we doing in the prison? It's all about policy. But some of the most innovative and effective work that's been happening in gang violence prevention in the US has not been policy change, but has actually been social enterprise. This began really because I was burying kids. So I buried my first in 1988 and my 180th uh, just before this past Christmas. 88 to 98 was just the worst. Reaching 1,000 gang-related homicides in 1992 in LA County, which is, it's, it's never been like that before. So we started to do things. We started a school, a jobs program. Um, then we couldn't find enough felony-friendly employers, so we started our, a business, and then another business. And then, and here we are, this is our fourth location. You know, 1,100 gangs, 86,000 gang members, so about 15,000 folks walk through our doors a year. In California, you can walk into a grocery store and you can buy chips and salsa that were made by ex-felons. Because someone decided that the problem was, was that there weren't enough jobs for people who were getting into gangs in the neighborhoods where gangs were, were prevalent. So instead of changing a policy, or putting up a billboard that tells people not to join a gang, they said, we just need to create the damn jobs. And so they did. And so now there's a bakery, now there's a chips and salsa manufacturer, now there's a cafe, now there's, and, and this is a business. Of course, there's some you know, uh, uh, subsidizing that occurs by donations and things, this is a charity, but it is a social enterprise. It is people working in a real business to cause change as a transition from prison to real life because they learned that it wasn't that they didn't know that what they were doing was bad or that the penalties weren't bad enough, but that there wasn't another option. And if there isn't another option, it doesn't matter how big the consequence is, you're just gonna keep doing it. So again, thinking bigger than just, in this case, policy change, and thinking like a social marketer. And then what about tobacco? Here is an example of a uh, typical approach to tobacco prevention for young people. One in three kids who smoke will die from it. Let's scare them, <laughs> right? We haven't scared them enough quite yet, so let's scare them some more. And in youth tobacco prevention in the, in the US, there's been significant progress, as there's been in many other countries. And the kids who are left who smoke, they tend to not smoke because they don't believe it's going to hurt them. They smoke because in whatever group that they belong to, they believe it's still cool. And this is an area where we do a lot of work, where we go in and we do research to find out, well, what are the different groups that exist in a community? And this is a, a state, uh, the state of Virginia in, 
in the US and we find out, okay, well there's all these kids that identify with preppy culture, all these kids that identify with mainstream culture and hip hop culture, alternative and country culture. And then we say, well, which ones of them are smoking? And we find these huge differences that while only 10% of the mainstream kids are smoking, we have 30% of the alternative kids smoking. And we say, well, there's something here. It's not just that they're scared or not scared, it's that there are some groups that are still perpetuating tobacco use as a cool behavior, and others that are actually already discouraging it pretty far. And those mainstream kids were the kids that were about to drown, the poor mainstream kids. They weren't even the ones smoking to begin with. <laughs> drown some alternative kids. <laughs> and so what we do is we say, well, why don't we look to change the culture amongst these groups, amongst the groups that haven't been targeted in tobacco control, instead of trying to target every teenager at once. And we, and we end up with things like this. Um, campaigns to reach hip hop culture. I have big dreams, and I hustle hard to reach them. I figure if I don't invest in my dreams, who will? So I keep on my grind and spend my money on inspiration, on the right tools for anything and everything that can take me and my brand big. And I would never disrespect the hustle by wasting my money on cigs, because I use my money to match my ambition. Dream big, hustle tobacco free. That's fresh society. So trying to align the specifically hip hop cultural values with being tobacco free. And in this case, trying to align country cultures with being tobacco free. It's hard riding when the riding's hard. It's the freedom that you can only find in the American air. It's called true country living. And the living is good when you're free from the addiction caused by chew or cigarettes. Because true country is about truly being free to make each day count for that extra mile. Stay true, live tobacco free, live down and dirty. So a completely different culture, completely different values, trying to find a way to align that, that uh, behavior with that culture. So again, this is looking at culture change rather than health education. And so the last part is, uh, the, the last example here is healthy eating for parents. So for parents, a lot of times we're defaulting to some of the old tactics. And here's this example. So, um, health education, right? Let's, let's remind them that eating fast food makes you fat. Well, you know what? I think the mirror told them that a long time before they saw your commercial. And so, instead of resorting to basic health education and basic fear tactics, we need to, there's many underlying issues to adult obesity and, and uh, children obesity that, that's led from that. But one of the biggest issues is they don't even know where to get healthier foods because they're not even in their neighborhood some of the times. Or they can't even afford them. So, and in this case, policy change can make a huge difference. So it's not that any one of these strategies is any better than the other, it's just that oftentimes the wrong strategy is applied in the wrong situation to the wrong problem. And we as social marketers, we could actually fix this, but in order to fix this, we gotta zoom out. And we have to think bigger. Because we're not gonna convince that governor to listen to us or that reporter to listen to us if we're so deep into the strategy that we can't zoom out to explain it in one succinct sentence of how great what it is that we do is. And in order to be able to do that, we have to start to break these silos. I tend to think of us as silo breakers. Everyone here is aware of more than one of those strategies and has probably used more than one of those strategies before. But we're a small group right now. Much bigger groups are gathering and talking about, well, what policy do we change next because it's not working? Or gathering and talking about, well, what education do we change next? They're not gonna break the silos. We have to break the silos for them and invite them to kind of a bigger tent, a bigger tent of what behavior change can be. And so let's represent all behavior change marketing, not just the kinds that tick all the boxes, but all of them. And it's okay if some of them are bad. Let's point it out that it's bad and let's show them how to improve it. 
Because if we say you are social marketing and you're not, well then we end up losing all of these folks that will help us become a bigger community that drives more funding and that drives more change. Um, this is what we hope to do uh, with the Agents of Change Summit. Um, so, 20 minute plug there. But, um, <laughs> Uh, in the very, very, very early stages, uh, all, all we did is really just make this slide. Um, and so, uh, but we have time. It's next February uh, in San Diego. So if you want to head out to San Diego, uh, please do. And if you're interested in helping us uh, put something together to break down these silos, please let us know. Thank you very much.